Welcome to Dynasty Life. I'm Theo Greminger. Redraft ends and Dynasty is life. Uh, I'm really excited about today. Uh, this is the second in my uh, series of Dynasty rankings shows. And I'm really excited today because the guest that I'm being joined by is not only one of the sharpest guys out there, but he's also one of my best friends in the industry. And that's Dan Williamson. I podcasted with Dan probably a thousand times. I mean, literally a thousand times at this point. Um, we used to podcast weekly, bi-weekly, uh, did a ton with the GOAT District. Now Dan's over at Player Profiler. Dan, you're you're crushing it with Bradley Stalder on Stack Hunters, and you've developed sort of a reputation with our audience recently with your best ball acumen. But when it comes down to it, Dynasty is where I like talking to you the most. You're also a hell of a redraft player with receipts to prove it. Dan and I share some FFPC main events, some high-end NFFC uh, leagues. We've, we've done very well over the years. Dan's not the kind of guy you want to see in your draft room. But when it all comes down to it, what's your favorite your favorite format for, for fantasy football these days? Do you Is it the best ball? Is it the dynasty? Or is it is it the redraft? Or is it all three? It, it really is all three. I mean, it's just so tough to decide. I mean, you know, certain times of year, like right now, it's just so fantastic for dynasty uh, you know, but the, it's also very underrated for best ball because you just have so much going on in the NFL and the better you can uh, predict and react to the changes and figure things out before the next guy, uh, you know, in both formats, it really, really makes a difference and, uh, and definitely appreciate you having me on here, Theo. No, I bet I mean, it's a long time coming. Um, the, you know, Dan's also a little bit of a tight end whisperer. Uh, I, it's a joke, you know, Andrew Cooper and Dan Williamson and I kind of made this uh, joke. Andrew and Dan are like the tight end whisperers of like the fantasy football community. Um, Dan could talk about any single position, but I'm really glad I have you on for tight ends. Uh, when I when I talked to Dan about coming on Dynasty Life, I'm like, listen, you can kind of pick any position you want, but you really should do tight ends. You're, you're kind of typecasted <laughs> for this one. But uh, yeah, getting back to what you said, like a lot of people will say it's too much, but I feel like it, you get better when you stay in the cycle. So for me, early best ball drafts kind of harden you. They kind of show you that the rookies people are, are high up on. Then they also show you kind of the values. And when you're able to kind of absorb best ball, early best ball, it's just going to make you a better dynasty manager. And then when it comes down to it, if you play redraft, even if your, your primary focus is redraft, um, you'll find that a lot of the great, redraft managers still have some dynasty uh, teams it, there's no better way to learn about the rookies to think about players as declining assets um, and guys that can pop um, after maybe struggling a year before than dynasty and I think it keeps the cyclical nature of fantasy football it's it's really something we encourage and Dan we've got a couple of really good high stakes managers in redraft to kind of come over to the dark side here and be like all in with their with their dynasty teams. Shout out to Abib Agbatoba, our friend who, you know, has won. I'm not even going to say how much money. Let's say uh, enough that he's on the IRS's radar every single year. Like he's in a bunch of dynasty leagues with us now, and he'll sometimes be like, "Theo, I hate you," because now I can't stop thinking about my dynasty teams. But it really is that way. Once you come over here, it's like you. How? Let me ask you this, Dan. I ask people this sometimes uh, in this chair. How many times a day do you look at your dynasty rosters? Oh my God. Uh, <laughs> this time of year? Ten, it, I mean, yeah, 10, 20, 30, 40. I mean, you know, it, it, it depends on the day, but yeah, there are days where I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm bebopping back and forth between rosters and sending out, uh, you know, trades and, you know, responding to trades and just, you know, kind of trying to figure out uh, how am I going to attack the rookie draft here? Everything. So yeah, I mean, uh, multiple times a day. Yeah, it's, it's multiple times a day. And I think for me, this time of year, because we play a lot of FFPC Dynasty Leagues, and we have our FFPC cutdown day right at the end of March. I, the first thing I do when I wake up in the morning, like before I do anything, is I pull up on my phone. I make sure I'm not about to time out of an underdog draft. And I usually have like one that's like 30 minutes to go. I'll get a pick in. And I, a lot of slow drafts. And then I check my my email to see if I missed any any trade offers. And lo and behold, this time of year, if you're a high volume dynasty manager, you have a bunch of trade trade offers. I'm also in a startup draft right now, uh, which I've been texting Dan. I, I shout out to Austin Martin. Austin and Dan have just and and and, and uh, Andrew Schellenberg, another former Goat District guy. We've I, they've been getting my texts kind of like my I'm OTC. 
you know, what do you think of this pick and all that kind of stuff. So that's that's high praise right there, Dan. But uh, we got to talk about tight ends. This is this is like your specialty. Uh, and when I say Dan's specialty is the tight end position, I think people can kind of get that as sort of a misnomer. When I talk to guys like you and our friend Andrew Cooper of Fantasy Alarm, and I say you guys are tight end whisperers, that doesn't mean that Dan's like, oh my gosh, I must have the tight end one on all my dynasty rosters. It's sort of a ability to spot value, uh, and that could be with a high end tight end all the way down to a low end tight end that the the market is kind of mispricing. Would you kind of agree with that, Dan? Oh, I would definitely agree with that. A, a lot of you know, kind of becoming a tight end whisperer, if you want to call it that, but just understanding the tight end position is so that you can be comfortable drafting tight ends wherever you need to in a draft. I mean, you know, there's sometimes where, uh, you know, it might not be wise to draft a, a high end tight end or you can't do it or, you know, whatever the case might be. But if you're comfortable at all levels of the tight end position and knowing what you can get, it just makes the drafts flow a lot easier. So um, a lot of people just kind of give up on the tight end position. And I think that's the wrong way to go about it. So when you enter into a dynasty startup, we're at that sort of sort of season, you simply keep an open mind with your tight end plan and, and sort of have targets, uh, you know, when it, when it comes down to different segments of the draft, would you, would you agree with that, Dan? Yeah, definitely. Because, you know, that's the nice thing is, you know, people who aren't comfortable with tight end, a lot of times they feel like, oh, I got to go out there and get an elite option. Um, or they're going to get somebody who just scored well last year, you know, and just try to get through it that way. I want to be to the point where, you know, again, I'm, I'm very comfortable going, you know what, I, I see a better value here at wide receiver running back. I'll get tight end later. I can still handle it. Yeah, Dan, I think the one thing that, you know, discussing teams over the years with you, when we split teams or whether we just kind of compete against one another is you're willing to kind of say, this is the value I'm going to dive into it. And you kind of can be a little bit position averse. I know you've got some really strong thoughts on quarterbacks and uh, you know, tight ends sort of similar in, in some senses where it's a one-off position for many leagues. Uh, however, we also play tight end premium. Does your philosophy on the tight end position change when you enter into a tight end premium uh, format, or do you think sometimes that can get managers in trouble where of course a guy like Travis Kelsey in years past has been sort of a weapon of mass destruction for tight end premium managers, but does it elevate the non elite tight ends to a level that they shouldn't be in for some managers? Yeah, I think it does. I mean, the, the main thing with the tight end premium is it just kind of changes the scoring dynamic within the tight end position. So you know, it, you've got, you know, it does push the whole position up some, you know, which we understand, but within the position, you've got some players that are very touchdown dependent um, and other players that are just, you know, they're, they're cranking out catches and they might not necessarily catch as many touchdowns. So how they, how you value them within the position definitely changes. And overall, it just pushes tight end up a little bit, but it's nothing that I really worry about. Like I'm not, you know, I've got to get an elite tight end because this is a tight end premium league. Um, I don't feel that way at all. I, it, I just, you know, I have to change how I look at the tight end position slightly and read and react to that. When you enter into a dynasty startup or, you know, you simply are building your rosters, you know, year in, year out, are you more comfortable being weaker at tight end or running back two? I'm definitely more comfortable being, well, both of them really, but uh, yeah. I'm very comfortable being weak at tight end. Because the thing is, I, I know how to spot early on in the season. You know, I can go into the season and just not really feel comfortable at tight end, but I still feel comfortable that within two, three, four weeks, I'm going to have a couple guys I'm really comfortable with. Because every year, there are guys who kind of come out of nowhere. You know, even for guys like Andrew or myself who study the position a lot, you know, we're not necessarily expecting these guys to, to pop, but we know what the signs are of is this real or is this not and you know if we see somebody getting a ton of targets at the tight end position we we're like yeah this is likely to continue you know we're on them before most people are most people are still going oh that's just you know kind of a one-off fluke or whatever and they're ignoring the tight end position they're like oh i'm okay i've got i've already got my guy yeah and last year was was a prime example on being able to spot like rising values certainly sam laporta was a guy that was being drafted in, in every single league, but this was still a guy that you could have acquired 
uh, you know, early on in the dynasty season, some people felt like maybe they were selling high, uh, whereas you ended up with the tight end one overall. Evan Ingram finishes tight end two, was never drafted in, in that area at all. And then you, like you talk about the guys popping every single year, Trey McBride was a waiver wire addition, even in some FFPC dynasty leagues, because he did nothing as a rookie. And Jake Ferguson was another guy that people were trading, you know, low end picks for people were basically drafting him in the FFPC rookie drafts as a second year player, because he didn't make it through cuts. Those two players both finish as top nine tight ends in PPR scoring. Uh, and McBride right now is a incredible dynasty asset to have. So I completely agree with you. I remember the year that Logan Thomas had his big w- breakout in Washington, how much Logan Thomas you had. I mean, year in, year out, you can find these sort of like off the radar tight ends. Dalton Schultz had that top three finish basically as a waiver wire guy. So it does exist and it does exist for dynasty managers too. Um, Ingram last year also. I mean, you know, in the off season before last season started, you could pick up Ingram for a song. And uh, I did that in several places. Yeah. I, I traded a lot last year. I, you know, I have a lot of Ingram right now. I'm not looking to trade him anywhere because he's in such good shape, uh, you know, heading into to this season, especially with Calvin Ridley, you know, now a Tennessee Titan. But Ingram was a guy that the market never sort of believed in. Uh, he had an exceptional first year in Jacksonville, and you were still able to trade like a second round pick, whether it was a 2024 blind one or like a mid, you know, 2023 one. And a lot of managers were like, okay, I'll, I'll move on from Ingram. Now Ingram... You know, he had that little fear and trepidation with the contract last year. Then he gets paid, and the market still didn't move on him. Well, let's stick with that. Th- is this a new archetype in the NFL, Dan? We-, we went from years of having, like, these incredible Jimmy Graham, Tony Gonzalez-type guys that were not only exceptional athletes and highly productive players, Rob Gronkowski, but they were also these massive humans that were basically defensive lineman sized, you know, 260 pounds, six foot five, six foot six. But now it seems like the archetype is changing. We saw the wide receiver position kind of shrink a little bit. And we've also sort of seen it with the tight end right now of the tight ends. Several of the tight ends we're betting on in dynasty, Sam Laporta, Trey McBride, Dalton Kincaid, and even Evan Ingram, who's a little bit older, but he's still, has incredible value. These guys are all like six foot three, six foot four, 240 pounds, 245. No one's really tipping the scales at 250. They look sort of like bigger wide receivers more than like some hulking, you know, uh, old school Ben Watson type tight end. Yeah, it's, it's definitely a new archetype. Um, you know, it, it, what it comes down to at tight end is you, you want to be able to bully the safeties and, uh, you know, run past the linebackers. And, uh, you know, this is just showing that a new body type can still get those things done and also, uh, you know, manage to work against cornerbacks from time to time because a lot of times slot cornerbacks are coming in there and covering as well. So, uh, you know, this is when you've got Laporta, McBride, uh, Ingram, Laporta runs a four five nine, McBride a four six one, Ingram a four four two. Kincaid's probably the slowest one, four six eight. But you know they they've got that fast time to go with their um, you know a little bit smaller body type, and they're a little bit more agile. And the the agility is what else I look for in a tight end uh, when I'm looking at tight ends that are coming out of school. Um, I want to I want to see the speed, I want to see the size, and I want to see the agility. And if I see those things. I'm going to be taking shots on them because it's still really tough to tell exactly who's going to pan out and who isn't. But if you have those things, you're putting the odds in your favor. Yeah, I like I like what you what you said there, and I think that we've seen like hits with with at the tight end position from several different rounds. I mean, Sam Laporta was a second round pick. Trey McBride was a second round pick. Dalton Kincaid a late first. Uh, Evan Ingram, uh, you know, obviously a very high draft pick uh, when he was drafted as well. But you could sometimes find these tight ends that are, you know, day three guys, and they can still be very effective. You know, you look at the the Mark Andrews's, the George Kittles, these kind of guys were were really really good players uh, for fantasy, and still are, and we're able to get them a little late. So I think the tight end position, unlike others, it's a position where we can find value on the waiver wire, we can find value later in rookie drafts, um, it's and we can find value in dynasty trades. So it's really a position where. 
spending some extra time, being extra cagey with it, uh, is is goes a long way. And Dan, let me ask you this: Do are we seeing a sort of a changing in the NFL of the importance of the tight end position? And are we going to continue to see a number of high end scores? Last year, we saw six tight ends put up over 200 PPR points. In previous years, we'd be lucky to get two or three. Do you think that this was a sign of things to come and a this is a trend that we should look for? Or is this something where things just kind of fell in place and uh, that's a, kind of a one-off in terms of overall production? Yeah, so I think there's a couple things going on here. Number one, uh, if you can play in 12 personnel and have two tight ends on the field, uh, and you can run or pass equally well out of that formation, it just makes it tougher on the defense. So a, a lot of teams are starting to you know, get that second tight end, get a, a really good receiving tight end if they don't have one, so that they can play in 12 and they can uh, you know, make it tougher on the defense. The other thing is on the salary cap, you know, wide receivers, the, the top wide receivers are now starting to sign contracts for, you know, 30 million plus a year. You know, Justin Jefferson's probably going to go for 33 to 35 million, they say, you know, whereas a top tight end, you know, there's still 15 million or less. So this is a good way to save on the salary cap for teams as well. You know, if you can get a tight end, that's a really, really good receiver and pay him, you know, 10, $12 million a year, something like that, instead of your, you know, 20, 22, $23 million wide receiver, that's a big, big savings that you can put into, uh, you know, extending your quarterback or, or, or just shoring up other areas of the team. So it makes a ton of sense for teams in both ways. I love that answer. Uh, the salary cap answers is a, is a huge one. And that's kind of leads to a little bit of a conspiracy theory I have about Brock Bowers. I think he's going to be extremely – you know, Dan, I, I love talking about my rookie tight ends. You know, whether it's Pat Fryermuth, Dalton Kincaid, or now Brock Bowers, I, I have an affinity for these young tight ends when they come in the league. But Brock Bowers is, is an exceptional player by all accounts. He's getting going to be drafted in the top 15 picks in the NFL draft. But I think he could end up being a kind of a top, top 10 lock because I everything you just said, where an NFL team not only is going to have this exceptional weapon – that they can use, uh, you know, to find mismatches uh, on the, against the defense and get, you know, production uh, offensively. But they're also never going to have to pay Brock Bowers the same that they would have to pay, you know, forget forget Marvin Harrison Jr. But these wide receivers like Brian Thomas and Xavier Worthy, who are going to be, you know, mid to late first round picks, they're going to end up with with higher contracts potentially than Bowers, even if they're less productive players. Yeah, and, and the thing is, what might actually hurt Bowers is the fact that he does play tight end and teams are looking to get more cost control on these wide receivers really early in the draft because like after you get past the first 10, 12 positions, uh, you know, all of a sudden the rookie contracts start dropping off a lot more as far as their total value. Uh, you know, so pushing the wide receivers up to get that extra cost control because you can get that five years of control, even though it's more expensive in the top 10 picks, you get that cost control. Whereas with the tight end, it's a little bit less important to get that cost control because you can, you know, you can still have them for five years. You're going to get them at a little bit of a lower contract figure. And also, you know, you can still go out and sign them, you know, re-sign them after four years or whatever uh, to a smaller contract. So that, you know, I think the cross control will push up the wide receivers a little bit more into the top 10. Might keep Bowers out of the top 10. I think the Jets maybe at 10 might be his first real shot. Yeah, for me, I'd love to see him end up in Denver because there's a lack of target competition. And I think that's his path to like 125 to 140 targets uh, for consecutive seasons. Where would be kind of like your nuts landing spot for a uh, tight end like Bowers in this particular NFL draft, a team that yeah. you get extra excited about. I, I think the Jets would be great with, uh, you know, with Aaron Rodgers. Um, Denver would be really, really nice. Uh, you know, obviously he'd look very good on the Chargers if they end up trading down. Uh, that could be a possibility. So, you know, there, there are a few ways we could see that go, but those are probably my, my favorite three teams right now. And Dan, you always love throwing out a cautionary tale. You always love being a, like a Debbie Downer for my enthusiasm with these young players. And, you know, uh, Dan, you get a big hat tip because a few years back when Kyle Pitts was in Fuego in both redraft as a rookie 
and in Dynasty, you know, you wanted to pump the brakes a little bit. And his first year, he kind of made you look like, uh oh, maybe Dan's going to be wrong on this one. Had a thousand yard rookie season, almost 70 catches as a rookie, didn't score a lot of touchdowns. But then year two and year three of his career have been absolutely painful. Uh, whether you're a dynasty manager or a redraft manager, he certainly was not returning value to you. But Dan, you are finally optimistic about Kyle Pitts in entering year four. Um, how enthusiastic are you about him in this offense with Kirk Cousins, with Drake London in a Sean McVay-esque Atlanta Falcons attack? Yeah, I'm fairly optimistic just because of the quality of quarterback play. He's played with some terrible quarterbacks. His first year, he played with Matt Ryan, and he did pretty well, except he just didn't score touchdowns. I mean, he did have 110 targets. He had 68 receptions and over 1,000 yards, but famously only one touchdown as well. Uh, you know, and that's a little bit of uh, a variant. But then the last two years, um, he's gotten 59 targets and 90 targets. Now, he was hurt two years ago, so, you know, that's why only 59 targets and 90 targets. But when you look at uh, his catch percentage, he caught only 28 of the 59, and he caught only 53 of the 90, um, you know, which is not a great catch rate. And I don't put that on pits. I think that's just, you know, from what I saw, more inaccurate balls coming from uh, Mariota, Ritter, and, you know, quarterbacks like that. Um, so I think, you know, if we can bump him up back over 100 targets, which I think is very likely with Cousins, we're going to see some pretty good results and we're going to finally get a true idea of how good is Pitts really. Uh, you know, I, I, I do have some concerns because even, you know, in his first year with Matt Ryan, you know, 68 catches on 110 targets is not great for a tight end. You like to see him more around the 75% mark, but, you know, it's all it was also his first year. So, uh, we'll we'll find out a lot about Pitts this year. Yeah, and and one notable thing about Kyle Pitts is he's still only twenty three and a half years old. So we're talking about mm -hmm. him being younger than Trey McBride, being younger than Dalton Kincaid. Um, always interesting to look at this sort of thing in context. He'll be entering his fourth year in the NFL, but he came in so young uh, that you know certainly that experience should potentially help him. Um, and we've seen a lot of these tight ends not really break out until a little bit older in their career. Whereas with Kyle Pitts, we have seen a thousand yard season. We have seen nearly 70 catches. We would love to see a return to 68 catches and, and a thousand yards. That would be a big win for Kyle Pitts managers. Dan, who's the most underrated tight end in dynasty right now? I mean, right now, I think you gotta, you at least gotta talk about Evan Ingram uh, yes. because he's still, you know, people are like, well, now he's old, you know, well, you know, I don't care that much. He's only 29 years old. Uh, we commonly see tight ends play, you know, into 33, 34-year-old range and, and still do pretty well. You know, and in Dynasty, I'm not really looking beyond a couple of years anyway. Uh, you know, I can always uh, find somebody else to pivot to if I need to. So I, I like Ingram just because of his, you know, the next couple of years outlook looks really, really great to me. Uh, Mark Andrews kind of for the same way, you know, people are, there's a little bit of recency bias going on and people are like, oh, Mark Andrews is always hurt. Well, he's not really always hurt. He was just hurt last year. He has had some, you know, some times where he played at less than a hundred percent. I'll give you that. But, uh, when Andrews is cooking, he's, he's still really good. And, uh, you know, if you want a really deep one, uh, Noah Fant, give me, give me a little bit of Noah Fant at a super cheap price. All, all the all the roadblocks left uh, Seattle. You know, we we don't have Colby Parkinson. We don't have Will Disley. We don't have uh, Shane Waldron uh, running the three headed monster at tight end anymore. Uh, Fant actually was starting to look pretty good in Denver, despite the terrible quarterback play that he had to endure there. And then he gets traded to Seattle, and he gets mired in this hopeless committee. Uh, so. You know, right right now, uh, late in uh, best ball drafts, and uh, certainly on the back ends of my dynasty rosters, I'm I'm looking to catch uh, a little bit of Fant here and there. I like that one, and we talk about we've already seen it with Fant. You bring up Denver; he had two tight end one seasons, young in his career mm -hmm. in Denver, then gets sent to like Pete Carroll tight end hell over in Seattle. And it's funny, Dan, because Will Disley and Parkinson both got paid on the open market, and they kept Fant. So uh, it could be wheels up. We're certainly enthused about you know, Ryan Grubb and the passing attack in the context of, you know, the wide receivers there, but this could be like a sneaky, oh, look up, uh, no offense, tight end 12 this year, uh, just to, because he caught like eight touchdowns. 
So that's a, that's a great one. We're going to take a quick break. And then when we come back, Dan and I are going to be ranking our tight ends in Dynasty and not one after another. We're doing it collectively. So it's going to be a real argument to see just how early Dan is going to, going to allow me to rank Brock Bowers. We'll be right back. Now, I know many of you are looking for a secret weapon for your Dynasty League, and I have it. It's called the Dynasty Dominator app. You go to the App Store, go to Google Play. It's right there. It's $5 to download, and then every year it's $5 to load the next incoming class of rookies. You can add Superflex, add tight end premium. It's incredible because it allows you to look up players. It allows you to vote on whether a player is a buy, hold, or sell, and then see the market sentiment on that player. And you can compare their lifetime value rating from Player Profiler to their Dynasty ADP at the FFPC, all in the price lookup tool. And beyond that, we have a trade analyzer. So you'll never lose another Dynasty trade again. And in our settings, you can set, this is a win now team, this is a rebuilding team. And then we let you compare players. Look at their metrics side by side. Prospect metrics, NFL metrics. It's all there. It's five bucks in the app store. There's some add-ons for super flex and to buy the upcoming rookie class. Every year, you're going to spend $5 on this thing. And it's going to be well worth it. Welcome back to Dynasty Life. I'm Theo Greminger, joined by Dan Williamson. And Dan, it's it's time to do it. We're talking about tight end rankings. I, w- I wanted to get you out here in 45 minutes, but it's not looking like that right now, Dan, because we're 26 <laughs> minutes in and we didn't start yet. So I, I want to go ahead and get it out of the way. Is there any reason to not rank Sam Laporta as tight end one overall based on him looking incredible as a rookie, doing it on and not an exceptional amount of targets? He was extremely efficient with his touchdown scoring. If anything, Detroit might be looking at themselves and saying, hey, I know we've got Jameer Gibbs and Almond Ross St. Brown, Jamison Williams, but let's get this Laporta kid 20 more targets this year and see what he can do. Yeah, I, Laporta is kind of the no-brainer at this point, uh, playing on the great offense and, you know, just everything he said. Wheels up. I don't think we need to spend a lot of time talking about him. Done. So Sam Laporta is locked in as tight end one for both of us. Easy one. Uh, is there an argument to sell him in Dynasty, Dan, just based on the peak market? Or is it that's just kind of like, what are we doing here? You have an exceptional asset. Just hold on to it. I mean, if somebody makes me a godfather offer, sure. But uh, it's... It, you know, I, I'm not going to sell him unless I'm getting a premium. If you want any player on Dan Williamson's roster, if you offer him three first round picks, he's going to take it. That's just Probably. sort of a, sort, that's usually, usually. <laughs> uh, guys, okay, so we got Sam Laporta off the board. Tight end two, Dan. This one is an argument in the community. You've had, you have Trey McBride people, a lot of them. There's like a hive. Some people want to rank Trey McBride ahead of Sam Laporta. I'm not there. Brock Bowers would be my tight end two. Um, but I know you're not going to let me do that here. Mark Andrews, exceptional last year when he was on the field, but he is, you know, not old, but he's older than these guys. He's 28 and a half. Those three kind of jump out at me for the discussion for tight end two. Is there another player that you would consider in tight end two overall? Now I've, I've got my tight end two is uh, Trey McBride. Okay. I think, I, I think that's kind of the way to go. You know, that that's not to say that he can't fail. Um, but you've got the combination of, you know, he's got great trade value right now. Um, he's going to be, you know, kind of the most experienced, uh, player in the offense with the Cardinals. So I think he should have, uh, you know, he should be top two in targets. I'm sure they're going to add somebody really good at wide receiver. Um, you know, but McBride already has a chemistry going with, uh, with Kyler. So I, I just like that pick. I think it, it feels pretty comfortable here. And I'm okay with it. Trey, Trey McBride's the guy that I've got some exposure to in Dynasty. Um, not really looking to move on from him because, like, you're on him as tight end two. Jax Falcone's on him as tight end two. I have him as tight end three. But at the end of the day, like, I'm kind of – if Brock Bowers gives me 80 catches and 800 yards, um, then I'm happy with that where I've already seen it with Trey McBride. And like you said, they're going to add a wide receiver, but I think that helps the offense. It creates more scoring opportunities for Trey McBride. Like Trey McBride only had three touchdown catches on 80 catches. He could have eight next year and nobody's batting an eye. Uh, So his ceiling, I think, is a lot higher. Okay, Dan, tight end three. We're moving on. Am I allowed to rank Brock Bowers yet? You talk about trade equity. Trade equity is all there for my guy Bowers or make make a case for somebody else. 
All right, I'm going to make the case for uh, Hawkinson here. I think, okay. um, you know, even with Kirk Cousins leaving town, he's an integral part of that offense. Uh, he fits very well in the Kevin O'Connell offense. Uh, we've seen him do it. He's still plenty young in it, young enough. This year, you're going to take a little bit of a hit because he, I think there's a good chance he ends up on the pup for the first six weeks or whatever. So, you know, if that makes you nervous, I can understand moving Hawkinson down. But as far as like, you know, if we look at, um, you know, value from basically week nine or 10 or something like that of the season onwards through the next couple, three years, I think Hawkinson goes right up there. Uh, but I, I, I definitely see your point on Bowers, but I, I don't want to quite put him there yet, but go ahead. Give me your argument. Let's, okay. Let's, so let's, there's, let's hash there's, it out. there's several arguments here. So Hawkinson, I agree with you. I've actually been, made two trades for TJ Hawkinson recently in dynasty. And this is after I traded him early in the off season because, you know, I have a couple teams that are, you know, certainly win now. I got a lot of win now teams, uh, Dan, you know, just cause I'm trying to, I'm trying to take down all my dynasty leagues, but TJ Hawkinson was a guy where if I could pivot early in the off season before he lost value because of the, you know, the injury trepidation and you can see it in best ball. Like when best ball started, he was being drafted earlier. Now the market's kind of like, Oh, I'm going to maybe not have Hawkinson for half the season. I don't know. Dranking him third uh, overall when I have really good options right around him, a couple of younger players, and also like the argument for Hawkinson is there for Mark Andrews. Mark Andrews this year, I don't have to worry about him not scoring. I don't have to worry him be, about him being off the field. You talk about like you saw him score last year a lot of fantasy points. Well, Mark Andrews was also scoring a lot of fantasy points. Age-wise, they're separated by two years. Uh, Quarterback-wise, I have Lamar Jackson – Whereas Minnesota, I think when Minnesota adds one of these rookies, all of the pass catchers are going to gain dynasty value. But at the end of the day, there is a scenario that they get boxed out and they don't get access to any of the four. Maybe they end up with a Penix. Maybe they end up with a Bo Nix if they get completely boxed out. Now, I, I'd put that percentage low. I think they're going to get a trade done. But at the end of the day, it's the quarterback uncertainty, the target competition, and the fact that I'm not going to have TJ Hawkinson for a half of a year that scares me off of this one a little bit. And you talk about trade equity. Brock Bowers is worth more on the open trade market right now. I would argue that Dalton Kincaid, while I'm not arguing to take him here at tight end three, he's certainly got more trade equity than an injured TJ Hawkinson. So I have less flexibility with my roster uh, taking talk Hawkinson in a dynasty startup. So I would push oh, back here. I would say... All, all very fair points. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to offer a compromise, but... You know, I guess what I want to say is I think Hawkinson for rebuilders definitely needs to be up here. Um, yeah. You know, if you're a rebuilder, you want to go out there and get Hawkinson right now while you can. Or, you know, it, basically anytime bad news comes out about Hawkinson, oh, he might go on the pup, anything like that. That's your opportunity to get in there and try to buy. So, um, you know, and I, I did hopscotch off him in one league where I had Hawkinson. I made a trade, got some assets, and then I made another trade, and I got Trey McBride. I don't think I could have got done that straight trade straight up, but uh, I was able to, to accomplish it there. So here's my compromise. How about if I offer you Kyle Pitts to not put Brock Bowers in the three hole? I can't put I can't put Kyle Pitts ahead of Brock Bowers. Okay, I, I think but, for, for okay. So I would say it, Hawkinson. We could do a compromise here. We go Hawkinson and then Bowers would be a compromise and then move on. Let, let, let me let me give you my concerns about Bowers before we we throw them in here. Oh, yeah. Go, go ahead. Make everybody depressed, Dan. <laughs> okay. My concern, is, one of my big concerns is, is that he has not done any athletic testing, you know, and he's going, oh, my hamstring, whatever. I don't know. I mean, it just, it, it, it worries me, especially when we, we've, we've seen the guy, you know, he kind of looks a little Tom Brady-ish, uh, you know, Tom Brady combine photo, Brock Bowers combine photo, uh, you know, not, not that I'm saying we should put a ton of weight behind that, but when you see that and you see he did not want to test athletically, that does give me a little bit of a pause, you know, because we're talking about major, major assets and my, um, uh, Eric Ebron is going to be my cautionary tale. I know you hate when I bring him up. I hate people, it. But <laughs> because Eric Ebron was your Kyle Pitts cautionary tale, and it, it, it actually turned out really, really, really good. And, and the thing is, you know, here's the thing with Ebron is he had the speed. 
he had the size, he didn't have the agility. And we just don't know that about, you know, Bowers. We know that Bowers can smoke college competition, but the NFL is a little bit different. So I'm, I'm a little bit more trepidatious about Bowers. Um, you know, in Dynasty, with the trade value, that definitely, you know, it, it helps me go ahead and take him, you know, because of the fact that I know, hey, if I don't really want him, I can trade him off, you know, probably at several points during the year. I can find something I want to do with it. Or, you know, if he goes to the right place. Because the other thing is, we don't even know a landing spot. Uh, you know, Bowers could end up in a terrible landing spot, too. So that's, that's why I put Pitts above him. Pitts has got the quarterback. You know, I feel like he's finally got a chance to come into his own. Uh, so that's where I'm at. But okay, I'll, so I'll go either way you want. Having said all that, this this is your call. Okay, so I'm I'm leaning Bowers here, but I, I, I can get swayed into Hawk. Let's get Hawk off the board. I think this is a lesson learned for everybody is you go and trade for TJ Hawkinson. I'm in a dynasty startup this week, Dan, and I got him as tight end seven in the startup, which I thought was exceptional value. Let's take Hawkinson. Let's take Bowers. Let's move on. And then I got to talk to you about Kyle Pitts here because it seems like you want to rank him tight end five. Um, let me lock this in first with Bowers. Or excuse me, let's go your guy Hawkinson first. Since uh, you capitulated, we'll give you the three. <laughs> and then I will go to the four with my guy Bowers. So we have uh, only four guys ranked so far, and we've been talking for a long time. So it's Laporta, McBride, Hawkinson, Bowers. We're on tight end five. Uh, guys in consideration, Kyle Pitts. Mark Andrews, Dalton Kincaid, and then we have to talk about Evan Ingram, who I think we're both ahead of consensus on. But if I had to bet on somebody of this group scoring the most fantasy points this year, it's probably Evan Ingram. I'm not going to really push back on Ingram at all. Uh, I have Ingram and Pitts back to back in my ratings, so uh, I don't mind pushing Ingram up above. I, I actually put Pitts above Ingram as kind of a pre-capitulation to you because I was like, oh, okay. man, Theo, Theo's, Theo's going to want to go with uh, with Pitts over Ingram, and I'm not going to fight him on it. So, What is this, the fear you have with Mark Andrews being tight end five, Dan? Is it him being injured last year? Is it the changing of the Baltimore offense with Zay Flowers? What is it? Because I, I, be, I'm actually surprised that we're at tight end five and you're not stomping your feet for Mark Andrews. Well, and. Mark Andrews is my next guy up. So, you know, again, these are guys I'd be happy with any of them. So Ingram, Bowers, Andrews. So let's, let's go the 23-and-a-half-year-old Kyle Pitts as as tight end five. Uh, and then we're at Andrews versus Ingram. This is an interesting one, Dan, because I feel like in most FFPC leagues right now, I can get Evan Ingram plus for Mark Andrews, despite Evan Ingram having a tight end two finish last year. Despite everything, the market values Mark Andrews ahead of him. Is the market incorrect? No, I don't think so. I mean, I think, I, again, I think you can put these guys in either order, um, and I'm not going to quibble with it. I think Andrews is, the the only concern I have with him is just the volume of the Baltimore passing attack, you know, and if they go out and add another really good wide receiver in the draft or something like that, uh, you know, those those things could have something of an effect but Lamar loves him. I mean, you know, and he's a he's a huge red zone weapon. You know, I, I I'm totally fine with Andrews and then Ingram. Okay, so let's do it. So we're we we've gone Evan Ingram uh, and Mark Andrews back to back here, and I just will I'll bring up trade equity as kind of the tiebreaker here, Dan. Mark Andrews right. I think is worth more. Therefore, I'd rather have him. And scoring wise, it's flip a coin. Mark Andrews could outscore Evan Ingram next year, and Evan Ingram could outscore Mark Andrews, and I think. If, if you want to take away anything uh, from our ranking so far, your trade targets are TJ Hawkinson and, Ev and Evan Ingram. They're both in our top seven uh, pretty easily, and both of them are kind of at a cheaper value than I think they are. They should be. Um, so just to recap, Laporta, McBride, Hawkinson, Bowers, Kyle Pitts, Mark Andrews, Evan Ingram. We're through seven tight ends. Dan, I am going to stand for uh, a couple guys here. Dalton Kincaid, who, you know – had a really, really strong stretch last year. First round draft capital. Buffalo I lost Gabe Davis. Stephon Diggs could not be a bill th uh, this offseason. There's still a chance they move on from him. Uh, Kincaid is still young enough, 24 and a half. Flashed enough last year. Tons of trade equity. And then I'll throw in a couple other names. Uh, you know, certainly George Kittle, despite his age, could give us an exceptional scoring line. 
uh, David Njoku, Travis Kelsey. Uh, these sort of guys are all kind of in this mix for low end tight end one. Yeah, I I also have Kincaid here. Okay, um, so let's lock in Kincaid. We're both in lockstep. Share your thoughts on him though, Dan. Yeah, he's. A, I I do worry a little bit about target volume in that Buffalo offense. I mean, you know, there's a lot of ways it can break, right? Though, uh, you know, it just what concerns me is how little he got targeted at times last year. And you know, they've they've added some more slot weapons. But you know, one thing that kind of made me feel a little bit better about Kincaid was I was doing a little bit of digging into Curtis Samuel and Curtis Samuel actually, when he was back in Carolina, when he was on the same team as uh, Sean McDermott was uh, the defensive coach at that time, I believe he was, um, he was running 70 to 75% of his snaps out wide, not in the slot, which, you know, and ever since then he's been a slot guy and that's kind of been how he's typecast. But, you know, I think Buffalo is looking at that versatility. So, you know, if they can put Samuel out wide, that frees up snaps in uh, for Kincaid, uh, you know, who, as you pointed out, is a first round pick. He is a tight end and they have a little bit of a slower ramp up. So, you know, I think Kincaid belongs right here. And I like your Curtis Samuel versatility, not to get too off tight end, but I actually think they're going to give him rushing attempts. Uh, the, we saw that with Isaiah McKenzie. When McKenzie was there, he'd have like nine, 10 rushing attempts a year. Curtis Samuel, I could see having, you know, a weekly rushing attempt. And I think at the at the completely optimistic is it takes a little bit of a pressure off of James Cook, where they'll be able to use Curtis Samuel along, around the line of scrimmage in certain situations too. So I think the versatility is there. But I would or I would say that for the upside for King Kane as Ked Kane as a red zone weapon, not having Gabe Davis there, he becomes the de facto big body in the offense where we could see him take great strides this year. And also you have to think, you know, he conceded a lot to, to Dawson Knox early in the year last year. You're not going to have to go through those like painful early season weeks uh, with Kincaid. I think it's going to be more consistent. I think he finishes as a tight end one. He's locked in. So I would argue that my tight end 10 here, I'm, I want to take David and Joku ahead of George Kittle and Travis Kelsey. Kelsey, this could be his last year in football. We were worried he was going to retire this year. I don't want to dive into that. Um, you know, I'm not saying I, don't, I want to get rid of him on my, my rosters and I'm going for a title because he's going to score very, very well. But David Njoku is 27 and a half years old, started to really come on last year. They add Jerry Judy, um, which I think, if anything, kind of is going to sap targets from – a Mar not really sap, but kind of limit Amari Cooper's ceiling and sort of – make Elijah Moore kind of unrosterable in shallow leagues. Whereas David Njoku, I think the offense becomes even better, and he's he's shown it. David Njoku last year when the Browns were playing their best offensive football, David Njoku was playing his best offensive football. Despite Deshaun Watson coming back, I don't see how you put that back away with David Njoku. Yeah, he fits the offense really well. Uh, you know, and, and we saw Stefanski when he was with Minnesota using the tight end a lot, so... You know, it, this is definitely a great fit. He's at the right age. I also have him uh, right in the number nine spot as well. And one interesting thing about him is, you know, there's a couple things going on. Number one, uh, Cleveland is not going to be happy if Watson doesn't start performing like a, you know, franchise quarterback this year. Even though it would cost him 130 some million dollars in dead cap next year to cut him. Uh, we've just seen Russell Wilson get cut with $85 million in dead cap. I don't think it's out of the, the realm of possibility that Watson doesn't get cut with $136 million of dead cap if he's not performing because teams want to take that sting and move on. Um, so Jameis I think Winston. He, they got Jameis right, Winston. Right, they got and they got Jameis Winston, exactly. So, you know, they do have an option. Uh, you know, and Winston with his YOLO balls is kind of exactly oh, yeah. what you want it for fantasy. So, you know, and the, the other thing is Njoku uh, is going to be owed $20 million next year. Uh, his, his deal has been for peanuts, basically, until next year, and then all of a sudden it's $20 million. So they're going to have to figure out this year, do we want to extend Njoku or let him walk? Um, I think either way, it, it, you know, it's probably going to be good for Njoku. So I, I like the fact that he's coming on. Yeah, David Njoku... There's a ton of offenses we could we could say, oh my gosh, David and Joku. And how about K Travis Kelsey retires? 
and David Njoku just becomes the next Kansas City Chiefs tight end. I think we get excited about that one. Uh, there's about a million landing spots we could we could talk about that uh, David Njoku would would crush in. Uh, he's just an exceptional athlete. The fact that he's only 27 is wild. It feels like he's been in the league forever. Uh, but another one of these guys that came in the league young, and we're finally starting to see the production that we wanted early in his career. Not a cautionary tale, though. Go draft Brock Bowers, guys. Um, so let's keep keep going here, Dan. You got George Kittle, Travis Kelsey. They stand out uh, because of what they're going to give me this year. George Kittle, I don't think, is going to retire, though, in two years. Can I rank him ahead of Travis Kelsey, or do you want to make a stand nope. for Travis Kelsey? Right right now, you are following my rankings exactly. I've got Kittle and Kelsey. It's the next two. Okay, so yeah. let's lock those in. Kittle, I, I will go Kittle, and then let's go, uh, let's go Travis Kelsey. And we did not talk with each other before the show, so Dan and I were pretty in lockstep of that. So just to, you can – and it, Dan, let me just recap this and then add anything you want on Kelsey and Kittle – Laporta, McBride, Hawkinson, Bowers, Kyle Pitts, Mark Andrews, Evan Engram, Dalton Kincaid, David Njoku, George Kittle, Travis Kelsey. That's where we are at so far in our tight end rankings. Yes. And, and, and you know, just one thought on Bowers. If you want to dream a little bit on Bowers, imagine he starts kind of falling down through the teens and then Kansas City makes a move up to get him. That would get us really, 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 really excited. I don't see him. I see, I, and I, I'll push back on that one. I think that if he starts falling, the Cincinnati Bengals are just going to be licking their chops and say, "Okay, you know what, T. Higgins, you can leave next year because we'll just uh, replace your targets with Bowers." Love the Bengals as a landing spot too, if he can make it down that far, or if they can make the trade up to get him. Okay, so we, we're at this sort of range where now we got to start thinking. Uh, I'll throw a few guys' names out. Jake Ferguson is 25 years old. Uh, situation matters for, for tight ends, and he's in sort of the nuts situation uh, with tact- attached to Dak Prescott. No one's going to call Jake Ferguson an exceptional talent, but we've seen now like four or five years in a row of Dallas tight ends returning tight end one numbers with Dalton Schultz and then Jake Ferguson. We'll throw out Dallas Goddard, who's sort of a – he always sounds better than his production, like certainly a talented guy, but he's, uh, you know, now not only competing with Devonta Smith and AJ Brown every week for targets, but competing with Saquon Barkley for targets and touches. So he's sort of boxed out, but in a great offense, certainly talented Dalton Schultz. Uh, you know, this is a guy that's been producing for years. It's very boring, but he's right there. Uh, Cole Komet. And then we've got a couple of sleepers, some younger guys that we could kind of push up into the equation. Who would be your initial lean for the next tight end you would draft? I think I'd go Ferguson here. I'm just going to follow the production. Uh, the fact that he's tied to Dak for another year after this. And, you know, Dak just loves throwing to the tight end. So, uh, good offense. It's it, I think it's tough to go wrong with Ferguson. And he's not horribly expensive either in Dynasty. So, Cole Komet in year three had 73 catches. Chicago has added Keenan Allen. So this potentially brings down his target ceiling. But in terms of just pure receiving ability, Cole Komet's done it for, you know, two years in a row, or excuse me, three years of his career, he's had now uh, 50 or more receptions. So the guy can catch the football. He's kind of boring. Um, Which way are you going next? Dallas Goddard, certainly not boring, but the production's just not there. Like, we've never had a 70-catch season for for Goddard, We and we, we had it last year with Komet. And then Pat Fryermuth is sort of like a dead cat bounce guy. Michael Mayer was a guy last year we were very much into. There's a couple of interesting tight ends here. And, of course, course Schultz. What would be your next lean here, Dan? I'm okay going commit here, but he makes me nervous as heck because of a couple things. You know, number one, we had Shane Waldron, the the guy who was running the uh, three tight end mess in Seattle, moving over to Chicago. We've added all these offensive weapons. We now Gerald have Everett quarterback. too. You got to talk about and, your guy. And Gerald Everett, yes. And so we've got you know a new quarterback. We've got Keenan Allen, Gerald Everett being added in. You know, it, it, and they went out and they got Everett pretty quick in the process. You know, which says to me they're planning on using him. And I think that you know between Keenan Allen and Everett, that spells bad things for Komet's target volume. I still think Komet. Uh, you know, if we're talking about talent alone. He definitely belongs 
right on up there with any of these other guys. But, you know, again, it's, it, I'm concerned about him. But in a way, I think he almost fits in about as well as anybody else here. Yeah, I think I, we go commit. You, you hit the nail on the head. It's talent. So, like, situations can change. But at the end of the day, we also sometimes see rookie uh, QBs come in and just really like their tight ends. We all think, like, I, I mean, I, I personally think Caleb Williams is an outside shot of breaking the Bears record for touchdown passes in his rookie year. It's only 29. Um, I think he could go nuts with DJ Moore, Keenan Allen, DeAndre Swift out of the backfield. But at the end of the day, when the situations get tough, a lot of times rookie quarterbacks look for their tight ends as a safety blanket. Dan, maybe Cole Komet just catches 65 passes again in a much better offense. So I think we just rank Komet. We take the talent and the production we've seen. Now we're sort of at the Dallas Goddard, Dalton Schultz. Neither one of them is too exciting, but I'm not disappointed to have either one of them on my dynasty rosters. Fryermuth a year ago would have been like tight end 11. Uh, we're not even discussing him yet. He had a very poor year three and an injured one. And then Musgrave, Michael Mayer, a couple other uh, tight ends in the mix. But I think it, I think this comes down to Goddard or Schultz. Where are you at? Um, I I don't have Goddard for a while yet. Okay. Um, <laughs> I, I, he's he's down there at, towards the bottom of my top twenty. But uh, Schultz is kind of the safe guy. Uh, you know what you're going to get from him, uh, but there's there's almost no upside there either. So you know Schultz is kind of like, hey, if I got to have a guy that I I can throw into my lineups and get some tight end points and feel like he's going to do all right, that would be the guy. Um, if I'm searching for upside, I'm I'm going other places. But yeah, Schultz kind of fits in there. Uh, whatever the opposite well. of un- whatever the opposite of unknown upside, like we'll we'll say there's certain guys are unknown upside guys. And certain guys are known floor. Uh, right. I think that, that Dalton Schultz is known floor. But, Dan, the guy goes from Dak Prescott to C.J. Stroud, another efficient offense, and another guy who can produce in the red zone as a touchdown scorer. And one thing about Dalton Schultz is we thought that he was going to fall off big time from leaving Dallas. He actually was, if anything, better uh, at times last year. So uh, I, I think Dalton Schultz is fine here. It's boring, but he makes sense for your roster. Uh, let's talk about some of these younger guys. Let's talk about unknown upside. Luke Musgrave, Michael Mayer. We've got to throw Isaiah Likely's name into the mix. And I will throw out another rookie because I have rookie fever. I'll throw out the guys like Jatavian Sanders, Ben Sinat are kind of interesting to me just as I think they're going to be drafted on day two. They sort of fit that mold of tight ends that are more, more so than blockers that could be very, very good in uh, in fantasy. Where are you at your initial lean? Do you want to go with the kind of the dead cat bounce with Michael Mayer? I think we can go with Mayer here. Uh, I think he can kind of go with Fryermuth as well, because I don't Let's, think he's gonna. I don't think he's gonna get completely gassed out of this offense in uh, in Pittsburgh. Uh, Arthur Smith will use him, so I I think Musgrave. Also looks really good. I, I have them all kind of in a tier here. And the one guy I threw in that you didn't mention is I'll throw in Noah Fant. Because, again, he's still only 20, what, 26, 27 years old, something like that. Uh, let me look real quick. He's he's 26 years old and, uh, you know, has that Seattle offense, you know, to himself as far as tight end goes. So I think he kind of fits in here, too. But we're right now we're in a big tier you know where you can you can take any of these guys and you can make an argument for them and I I'm not going to push back too hard. Um, so you know I I, I think it's kind of dealer's choice. Yeah, I think you're I think you're right. Um, let me just see where we're at. Twelve, thirteen. We got seventeen. We're at seventeen. So let's. So I'm I'm with you. I think that the Musgrave, Fryermuth, Mayor, Tier all has unknown upside. They were all high draft capital guys, all three of them second round picks and all three of them, you know, relatively young. Mayer was one last year where a lot of people had him as tight end one in the process. Uh, Of course, it didn't really happen, but I think he could make a big uh, year two leap. Um, He's a guy that I like as a best ball target as well right now. I think Michael Mayer just go and get some. I think if we're doing this process a year from now, he'll be higher on this list than he is now. 
Muth, we've seen it two years of his career. I agree with you. Arthur Smith's not a negative for him. You know, you saw Johnny Smith excel last year. Um, you know, I think Muth, Muth in that offense is going to get back to like 80 plus targets. And then Musgrave. Musgrave is a, is a hyper athletic guy that could take a big step forward. Dan, your thoughts on Musgrave versus Tucker Craft? Because it's a little bit polarizing in the community where we saw a lot from Craft. We saw stuff from Musgrave. Both of them were day two picks. You, are you clearly Team Musgrave over Kraft? I am muddily Team Musgrave over Kraft. I think he's still probably got the edge. Uh, you know, and if it weren't for Kraft, Musgrave would be much further up this list for me. Um, I would have him up in the you know probably Jake Ferguson tier, it, easily, and maybe yeah. I, you know I could be talked into to going up a tier beyond that too. So. Uh, yeah, Kraft gives a little bit of pause just because, you know, we haven't seen enough from either one of these guys to say exactly what's going to happen. I mean, this is an offense that's still kind of, you know, being figured out. And I guess the, you know, the biggest thing that keeps both of them down here for me is the fact that Green Bay does have so many weapons, you know, in the passing game. And it's probably going to be, you know, trying like playing whack-a-mole trying to figure out who to start here. Uh, I feel much better about the Green Bay um pass catchers in uh in best ball for example than i do in dynasty okay we've reached that part of the show dan where i think we have to rank dallas goddard though i know it's right. low but in terms of startup value in terms of trade equity and in terms of con- like i hate to throw out the word contingent upside as an argument for guy but if devonta smith or aj brown or saquon misses time next year dallas goddard helps you win those weeks whereas we're getting down into the territory of guys that are not going to win you weeks, guys that are just kind of foundational pieces. Um, are you okay with me just getting Goddard out of the way? Yeah, I'm okay with you getting Goddard out of the way. And honestly, if you are, um, you know, looking to prune your dynasty roster, Goddard's still got pretty good name value. And I think now's the time to move him. He's 29 years old already. I mean, you know, next year he's going to be 30 and people are going to start thinking about that. So, you know, I think sometime this off season, if you can, uh, you know, like if you could make the move from Goddard to Musgrave or something like that, um, that's that's a step I would just go ahead and take. What okay, do you think so on that, Theo? I, I think Goddard, I don't have any Goddard left on my dynasty rosters. And I'm kind of glad about that because, again, he's he's like a, he's more of an idea than he is a guy actually scoring. And, and like you said, I think like if you ask people how old Dallas Goddard is, most people are not saying 30. For some reason, he's like one of these guys that seems younger too. So yes, Dan, I would pivot off of Goddard to getting myself in a position to draft Jatavian Sanders or Ben Sinat. And there's a couple other yes. tight ends in this class that people like. Like there's some Jaheim Bell guys. I had Brett Whitefield um, you know, on press coverage, and I think he's really, really smart with tight ends. He likes Jaheim Bell a lot as tight end three. But Sinat had that wonderful combine. These Both these guys are from Big 12 territory. Uh, where you're, where you know you're a Baylor guy, so you're you're uh, watching a lot of this Big Ten football. But Sanat crushed the combine. Sanders had a, a early breakout at Texas. Both of these guys run sub four seven forties. They both profile as receiving tight ends. I kind of like them both in this range. Mm-hmm. I know you talk about Noah Fant, but again with trade equity, I, Noah Fant, I'm happy to get in the top twenty four, but uh, not here. Yeah, I, that's that's fine. You can throw any of these guys in in front of Fant. You know, that, I guess what I would say for our listeners is, you know, don't don't forget about Fant just because he's ranked lower than these guys. I think there's a good chance that he could end up uh, pushed up this list a good bit by this time next year. So, you know, it, it it's it's just a very cheap. Um, option to get on the back end of your roster you don't want to be counting on Noah Fant you know like if you're going in Noah Fant's my tight end one uh, you're not doing this right but if you're going in and you can have uh, Noah Fant as your tight end two or tight end three I like that a lot because you're you want to have some of that upside ability in there and you know honestly we've got uh, Tyler Lockett on that team who's getting older and older uh, still like him we've got Jackson Smith and Jigba, who just didn't really do that much last year. Um, you know, it's too early to, you know, to bail on him or anything like that. But you can also see a path to where uh, Fant is getting an awful lot more targets than what anybody expects in this offense. So we're at 
tight end 20. And we want to get to 24 here, Dan. Um, and I got to get you out of here for your basketball game. So let's try to rip through this one. <laughs> Isaiah, right. Isaiah, I'll throw out Isaiah Likely. I'll throw out Kate Otten. Um, Isaiah Likely is interesting, though. You don't seem super enthused, but he's been very good in, in short spurts uh, for back-to-back seasons. Yeah, the, the main thing that concerns me about Likely is he's an absolute zero when Mark Andrews is playing. And, you know, so if you want to have him as a contingent guy, but he's, he's a guy you just absolutely cannot start if Mark Andrews is in the lineup. Who do you want to go here at tight end 21 then? Who's your lane? Um, let's see. Did you, you did get Fant on there? I can't no, see. No, let's you throw, let's just, let's just go through a fan in there. We'll make him yeah. tight end 21. Yep. Uh, so we have three more to rank here. Uh, I'll, I'll throw out also Hunter Henry. Uh, older, but not that old, and uh, he's he's a great touchdown scorer. Uh, the Patriots still don't have any weapons on offense, uh, you know. So there are some things to like about him. I understand if people want to push him on down, but um, you know, I, I you did get a couple of the rookies on there. Okay, good. Yeah, so. yeah. I'm I'm good with I'm good with and, Hunter Henry. I think Hunter Henry's and, a, a a good one, Dan. Yeah, and then Cade Otten, I think, rounds it out pretty nicely. I mean, he's not very athletic, but uh, he is filling a, a nice role in that Tampa offense. And unless we see them uh, jump up and you know grab a tight end high, um, you know, I, I think, think I'm, I, I'm miss, I must be missing one, Dan. I'm at I'm at Noah Fant than Hunter Henry, and I think yep. we have two more two more to go. Oh, okay, all right. Then, uh, well, I'd say Cade Otten for one of them for sure. So let's throw uh, Otten in. We can always change it around. Who, who do you like? Uh, do you want I to think put it's, likely? I think it's likely. For me, I okay. think it's likely because, uh, you know, when we start getting to this range, you know, you talk about how it's a contingent play, but likely versus, you know, any of these other guys. Are, Chigakonkwo, I, I think, was just kind of a little bit of a flash in the pan, whereas likely I've seen it for two straight years. But Chigakonkwo could be the other one that we can make an argument for. Uh, yeah, I that's... Seen it. That that's exactly where I, my mind was going as well is either likely or Okonkwo because Okonkwo at least gets a, a better offensive uh, system to work in now, but there's also a lot more competition for targets now uh, than the, what there was before. So uh, yeah, I, I I think likely's great. I mean, if you've got uh, Mark Andrews, I think likely is just almost a, a must-have handcuff because you know he he just fills in so well for him. Uh, you know, I would. I would pay, you know, I, I wouldn't say whatever it takes, but almost whatever it takes uh, just to be able to sleep at night. So you, you're you the guest, so we'll let you pick the last one, likely or Okonkwo to close it out? Let's go likely. Okay. Um, I, I, I just don't see that Okonkwo is going to get the targets he needs. And we definitely want to go Auden ahead of, uh, of, uh, of Okonkwo. I think I'm there as well. Yep. Okay, so let's recap it. Sam Laporta, Trey McBride, TJ Hawkinson, Brock Bowers, Kyle Pitts, that's our top five. Mark Andrews, Evan Engram, Dalton Kincaid, David Njoku, and George Kittle round out the top 10. Then Travis Kelsey, tight end 11, you know, enjoy him while you have him. Jake Ferguson, Cole Komet, Dalton Schultz, Michael Mayer, who we are bullish on taking a step forward, Pat Fryermuth, Luke Musgrave, Dallas Goddard, Jatavian Sanders, Ben Sinat, Noah Fant, Hunter Henry, Kate Otten and Isaiah Likely. Dan, this was a lot of fun. Uh, how far are your Baylor Bears going in the NCAA tournament? They are going to probably get knocked out because they just they love getting behind uh, by 10, 12, 14 points for early in games. Um, so I don't know. I, I, I think they can probably make the Sweet 16. I think uh, the Elite Eight would be a stretch, though. Your national champion choice. National champion, I mean, you know, honestly, you probably got to go with UConn. Um, you know, I know they're the prohibitive favorite, but uh, they, they look really, really good to me. So, Yeah, uh, UConn, UConn's my choice as well. The first back-to-back uh, national champion since Florida. But I think Purdue's going to make a real run. It's going to be a redemption song for Purdue. I think they're really good as well. Dan, this is a lot of fun. Let everybody know uh, where they can find your work. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, of course, you can find me on Player Profiler. Uh, I'm putting out occasional articles. Uh, should have one coming out soon on uh, some best ball targets. And uh, you can also find me on uh, Stack Hunters with Bradley Stadler every uh, every week. And uh, then 
occasionally, you know, just on other podcasts like this one or uh, Dynasty Warzone, you know. So we're... Wherever I'm needed, that's where I'm filling in. And of course, you can find me on Twitter at overhyped sleeper, all one word. Drop that final E from sleeper. Yeah, and check out all, everything Dan puts out is really, really strong stuff. His articles are really, really good. And Stack Hunters, if you're playing best ball and you're not watching Stack Hunters, you're doing it incorrectly. Uh, stick with us here at Player Profiler, heading up right into the NFL draft. We're going to be bringing back a bunch more rookie shows right here at Dynasty Life. I have two more of these ranking shows to go, uh, and enjoy the rest of your week. Hey, I want to thank you for being part of this broadcast. If you have any thoughts on it, leave a comment. If you enjoyed it, make sure you leave a like. And if you want to see more shows on the Player Profiler channel, subscribe to it. That's how we know you want more.